And um, to share a thought that I think is important for us to um, get today, right? Um, First Timothy 6, 6. And I'll probably go to a couple, a couple other passages of scriptures, but First Timothy 6, 6 is good. Um, Father, as we come, as we come to your word today, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word once again with your people. We ask, oh God, you would please breathe upon us and guide the message according to you, the way you would have it to go forth. And help me to clearly give forth the message you laid upon my heart. Give me that ability, oh God, to do that. And I'd be so careful to give your name, praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 All right. Um, <clears throat> First Timothy 6 and 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and certain we shall, we shall not carry anything out. And having food and clothes, with these we shall be content. All right? I just want to lift up the thought today about uh, the secret of contentment. The secret of contentment. I'll entitle this message, Secret of Contentment. We are in a world that is driven by discontentment. Discon people are discontent with their jobs, discontent with their families, discontent with their spouses, discontent with their children, discontent with their lives. There's a this we just in a world that's driven by discontentment. And uh the ad the advertisements on the TV drive you dis discontent with your things you have, the want more things and bigger things. And we're living in a world of turmoil because everybody is discontent with what they have and who they are and where they are. And this kind of attitude of discontentment drives uh, the uh, attitudes that of selfishness and greed and murder and backstabbing and backbiting are all are driven by this internal rage within us of not being content. In other words, not being satisfied. So contentment for uh, a definition is a satisfaction, a inner satisfaction, an inside satisfaction with who we are, um, where we are, and what we have. Who we are, where we are, what we have. It's a, and it's a satisfaction, I should add, for the child of God. It's a satisfaction that is not dependent upon our circumstances. Isn't that interesting for the child of God? Mm -hmm. It doesn't depend on our circumstances. Paul says here, as he writes to his young protege, protege, protege Timothy, he says that there's this combination of two, a marriage of two things that bring about contentment, that bring about wholeness in life. Godliness with contentment equals gain. Godliness with contentment equals gain. Now, I describe uh, contentment as a inner satisfaction, independent of circumstances. All right? Because we cannot control what happens to us. Matter of fact, what in life can we, can we control? We can't control our circumstances. We can't control other people. Matter of fact, most of us are out of control ourselves, aren't we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> We can't control how people respond. We can't control what happens to us, around us. All we can do as God's children is be in control of what happens inside of us or how we respond to life situations. So godliness with contentment. We I talked about contentment. What about godliness? Godliness is simply being like God in our character, in our actions, in our ways, in our thoughts, living a godly life. If you put these two together, godliness and contentment, you find out there's gain. People think that gain is godliness because some people feel like as long as what they're doing is bringing money in, then God must be with it. Mm -mm. God must be involved with it. But the Bible says that's not real gain. Just because you got more money, I mean you're gaining. Mm -hmm. But it says godliness with contentment is gain. Can you imagine the kind of person you be? Imagine this. Imagine the kind of person you would be if you didn't let circumstances dictate to you your well-being. Mm. 
There's two kind of water vessels that we, the main water vessels. There's the ones that ride on top of the water. And there's the ones that go underwater. The boats that ride on top of the water, they get to experience the waves, the storms, and the results of what's going on outside. Then the submarine. The submarine goes down deep. And the submarine, although the same storms are going on, doesn't feel the result of the storm because it rides deep. So what are you? Are you a ship that rides the waves? Or are you a submarine that goes down deep below the storm? Contentment has an idea of being independent of my circumstances. Can you imagine what kind of person you'd be and I would be if we learned to be content? What if I felt like I was enough? What if I felt like I had enough? What if I felt like where I was was enough? Then all of that edge would be off my life. It's not complacency that says, I'm going to sit here because this is all I'm going to get. It doesn't kill your dreams and aspirations. But what it says is, contentment says this, I'm going to be thankful for what I have right now and work with God, work with what God has given me until he gives me more. Y'all follow that? It's not mm -hmm. complacency. It's not that I don't have dreams, aspirations, and goals. I'm just going to sit here and say whatever happens, happens. But it says that what God has given me for this moment is enough. That's why content people are grateful people. Amen. Content people are great. They, content people are thankful people because they realize that, yes, there's other people that have more, but I thank God for what he's given me. Mm -hmm. A discontent person is always looking about what someone else has and said, if I could just get something else, I would feel so much better. If I could just have this next outfit, if I could have this bigger car, if I could have this, and you want to chasing stuff and chasing stuff and chasing stuff. But what about thanking God for what you do have? I thank mm -hmm. God because you know what? Although there's other people doing so much more better than you're doing, there's a whole lot of people under you also. Mm -hmm. So how about if I thank God for what I have? I did um, a, a message not too long ago on the, the um, talents, how verse one had certain talents, five, two, and one. We've got to thank God for what he gives us and work with what he gave us. Everybody's not a five, ten person. Some of us are two, some ones. But what you have to do is learn how to thank God for what he's given you and work with what God gave you and be faithful over that. So Paul says, he reminds us that you came into the world with nothing. And when you leave, you're going to leave with nothing. I, I, my reflections have been on Kobe Bryant um, ever since the tragic accident happened to him, I was thinking about how much this man has done, how much he has accumulated, and how much he left. But you got to understand this, that no matter what accumulations or what we achieve on this side, when we leave, we leave it at all. Mm -hmm. It's like I heard the story about um, a lawyer reading the will, reading the will of a rich man. And, and the people couldn't wait to hear what they had gotten. And they said, well, how much did he leave? The lawyer said everything. I need y'all get it slowly. Because <laughs> guess what? No matter how much you accumulate, no matter the reputation you have on this side, no matter how hard you work for it, guess what? When you leave, it's going. When God calls for your spirit, only thing leaving here, your body going to be in the grave, and your spirit going to be with God. So what are you taking with you? I never forget, I used to walk around uh, the house of um, my parents sometimes. We got ready to sell a house, and I walk around. My mother liked to collect these dolls, and she had dolls all over the house. But guess how many dolls she took with her? No. Not more. The things we love. None of the stuff we have that we get all set over and we work hard for and we uh, don't want people to walk on it or sit on it or use it. Guess what? We leave. It might be somebody's trash. Mm. So he's saying godliness, living a godly life and being content with the things God's giving you is much gain. There's so many people out here in an unrest right now because they're always reaching for more and more and more. And if you don't be careful, as a child of God, you'll be guilty of this thing called, the Bible says, the last commandment is called covet. Y'all shall not covet. Covetousness is that desire to have what someone else has. I'll let it get quiet here for a minute because how many of us have been guilty of that? Mm -hmm. All of us. <laughs> and, and it not only means things, Sometimes it's somebody's gifts. And in ministry, it could be someone's ministry. Mm -hmm. As a preacher, it could be another preacher. As a, as a, a person with a church, it could be someone's church. 
He doesn't just mean it, it has things involved. It also be someone's talents. It can bring about because we spend our time comparing ourselves with our, with, our, with other people. And that's the Bible says in Corinthians, that's not wise to compare yourself because everybody has their own distinct journey. Everybody has their own particular call. Everybody has their own particular purpose. So to compare yourself with someone else is true because what God had for them is not what God has for you. But guess what? What is God for you is not for them either. Right. Mm -hmm. How many are glad because God got something just for you? Amen. Amen. Just for me. He got something just for me. I can stay in my own lane. Amen. I don't have to get out of my lane to get something God has for someone else or worry about being shortchanged because whatever God has for us it is for us. So we talk about godliness with contentment. Yes. I want to take you to another passage of scripture real quick. And that is in James. James 4 and 1. James 4 and 1. If you managed to get there. And I, I want to spend a little time talking about the unrest that's in us. And seem to get some answers about what is the secret to having contentment in my life. All right. And then we'll find that in another passage. I'll take you to Philippians as we close out Philippians. But James 1 says this, where do wars and fights come from among you? He's not talking to street people. He's not talking to unsaved people. James is writing to Christians. He says, where do fights and wars come from among you? Where does the fighting come from? He says, do they not come from your own desire for pleasure? That war in your members? In other words, we fight with each other because we have war inside ourselves. We don't even get along with ourselves. How many of you had a war inside yourself, lady? That you've gone between what you should do and what you actually do. How you should act and what you actually act. I've got, I've got all kinds of things <laughs> happening in my life. I know that I don't need certain things. And I make my mind up that self, you're not going to get these things. Before I know it, what am I doing? Eating. Why are you saying I be food? I ain't mention food. <laughs> <laughs> Mind my business. <laughs> Make my mind up to live a healthy lifestyle. Determined to get my health together by God's grace. So there's wars inside of us. He says, Where do these why why do we argue with you? Can you imagine someone at war with himself dealing with issues and dealing with Decisions in themselves, and now I gotta go out to the public. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now I gotta go out to a whole bunch of other people who are at war. So, sure, by the time I get to the bank, I got stuff going on. Mm -hmm. You got stuff going on. The war inside of me never come outside of me. Why are people killing each other uh, at, ra at a rampant rate, a rampant pace? Because people have. War inside themselves. People have uh, a war within themselves, and this turmoil within, this discontent within, this desire within to have and not have, and you've got it, and I'm going to take yours. All of this stuff inside causes the crime and, and things in the street, causes people to hate each other. So it's a serious thing about being content. Mm -hmm. And if the world is, if the, if, if the church is not content, where does the world fall? Mm. If we're the ones who are supposed to have a light, if we're living lives of, 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 of unbridled desires, then what's going to happen to the world if they don't see it in us? One side of discontentment is complaining. Mm -hmm. That's one sign, right? Mm -hmm. The children of Israel, God brought them out of Egypt, but the challenge was get Egypt out of them. Mm -hmm. And God's brought them out of the world, hasn't he? What's the challenge? Getting the world's the ways of the world out of us. There's a, a challenge there. They kept desiring for what was. When God was saying, I'm bringing into new, some new things. And they began to complain. And how many started off in this journey and something that you didn't expect to happen, and then we start complaining? But we, we've got to learn to do is recognize that God is in control over everything. And cannot anything happen to us except it go through his seed, the seed of his hand. And it goes through the seal of his hand, it means he's working out for our good. And we, as children of God, we have to renew our minds to knowing that our God is really in control. Do you know he's in control? Do you know he's really in control? Do you know that even the bad stuff that happens to us, God has a purpose in those things? 
God has a way. I talked about it some other times, maybe Friday night. Talk about how God, what God does is that there's some things that God has put in us. There's some treasure God has put within us. There's some, some riches God has put within us. But those riches and that treasure is covered up with so much of us that God can't really bring out what he wants to bring in our lives. So what he does, he allows pressures of life to come our way. And through those pressures of life, what he does is that he breaks that stuff that's covering and that's keeping his true glory from coming through our lives. So we come through stuff, we lose the stuff that was holding us back. We come through things that one friend told me that because of what they went through, they started all over. I said, no, you don't start over. You build. Amen. <laughs> because you have a new start doesn't mean you start over. You don't forsake all the things you learn and experience. You bring those experiences, you bring those things God has taught you, and you add to those things. I know it's uncomfortable starting a new beginning. It's uncomfortable doing new things, but it's okay because God promised to be with you, not some of the way, but all the way. He said this word, I will never leave you nor forsake Thank you. you. We got that boast on me. Mm-hmm. But James says these wars are going on in our members. Within our members, there's wars. He says you, you verse 2, he says, you lust and do not have. Lust is another word for desire. You lust and do not have. And you murder and you covet and cannot obtain. That's frustrating. You want something, but you can't have it. Try to take someone else's. You desire what someone else has, but you still can't obtain it. He says you fight and war. But he says this, uh, someone answer. He says, you know, uh, a simple solution is this. He says, you do not have because you do not ask. Isn't that something? He says, you don't have what you want because did you ask for it? Did you ask for it? <laughs> did you ask for it? Isn't that something? Mm-hmm. Did you ask for what your desire was? You asked for it? He says, and you ask and you don't, what, what, what I have asked. I've been praying and praying and praying. People say that, I've been praying and praying and praying, asking God over and over again. He says, well, he says, you ask and you don't get it because you ask for the wrong reasons. A miss. You ask for the wrong reason. Your reason is, I want it because I want to do what I want to do. Mm-hmm. But how about you don't belong to yourself anymore? How about that you're not your own? How about you've been bought with a price? So we ask something, we have to ask, are we asking it for our glory or God's glory? And what prayer will he answer? <laughs> He's answering the prayers that bring glory to his kingdom, for the firmness of his, of his kingdom. So we're discontent because we're trying to rule our own world. Mm-hmm. We would tell our children, you can be whatever you want to be. And we tell them to go for stuff that they're not getting in. Hello. Everybody's not meant to be a doctor. Everybody's not meant to be uh, the president. We, well, I don't know now. <laughs> Anybody can be president. <laughs> That's the lower. That's standing the way lower. But we have to find out the gifts that God is placing a child and fan those flames. Because that's what God called them to do because every, every doctor's child is not meant to be a doctor. And every lawyer's child is not meant to be a lawyer. That may not be what God's called them to be. So to find out the gift that God has put in that child and push that child in that way, that's what the Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go. Find out the gifts and their strengths and push them in that area. Let them know you see something in them, and this will be a good feel for them to go in. Is that probably the gift that God's given them in their lives? Nobody has everything, but everybody has something. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. So he says that you want to spend them on your pleasures. And finally, I'm going to take us to Philippians because Paul's going to teach us something he learned. Philippians 4. We'll close out with that passage. Philippians 4.11. <coughs> I you don't get you to turn much. It's when we turn the pages. All right. <laughs> Use the bow. Amen. <laughs> Paul is writing to a church who has been there for him. The church of Philippi. Whenever Paul had a need, the church would send uh, supplies to him. Send him. He, Paul was a prisoner when he wrote this letter. He was in prison. But he was in prison. He was in the home arrest. You know, like now they put uh, anklets on you to keep track of you at home. They didn't have anklets back there. They had a guard you were chained to with your anklets. And those guards stayed with you and, and 
and change shifts. So Paul was, and Paul had to make sure they didn't feed you like we do today. Feed our prisoners. You had to get your own means of being feed, which meant you were dependent on other folk because you couldn't work. He was able to have business coming in and out. So this church was sending Paul money, sending him food, sending him everything he needed. So Paul was in prison because he preached the gospel and uh, about to be tried. And eventually Paul was beheaded for his faith. All right. But Paul in prison, if you read this book, one of his key words in his book is rejoice. Paul, how in the world did you get this kind of attitude? Mm -hmm. He not only said he rejoiced, he said, I want you to rejoice in the Lord always. Where did this joy and this exuberance and this contentment come from? How could Paul, who was in prison, be independent from his circumstances? How could Paul deal with people who were jealous of him, although he was arrested, they were glad he was in jail? How could Paul deal with lack of things? The lack of things coming his way. But God will provide through this church. God touched the hearts of God's people to give to this man. And Paul says this in response. He says, not that I speak in regard to need. He says, for I have learned in whatever state I am, I am in to be content. What is Paul talking about? Mm -hmm. Paul says, I have needs, but I'm not speaking out of my needs. He says, because I've learned something. He said, I learned no matter what happens around me or to me, I've learned how to be content. How many want to be that kind of person? Yeah. Amen. No matter what happens around me or to me, I've learned. But Paul didn't say it's something I got as a gift. He didn't say it came on me automatically. Paul said, I've learned. How many need that class? <laughs> I need that class. I need to learn. Paul said, I've learned how to be content. Regardless of my situation, I've learned how to find contentment. He says this. Now look, Paul experienced some things. He says in verse 12, I know how to be a base. That means to be low. I know how to bound. That means to be a high. Everywhere in all things, I've learned both to be full, to be hungry, both to be abound and to suffer need. Paul says life is full of ups and downs. Can I get a witness in? Mm -hmm. right there, right? Amen. Paul said, I had some good days and some bad days. <coughs> I had days I had everything I needed. I had days I had nothing. So anybody, is that, does that describe your life? The days mm -hmm. you have plenty, and some days you have enough to make it, and some days you seem like you have nothing. You know what you're in? You're in school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm in school. Because it's through the ups and downs of life, God trains us. He teaches us to be content wherever we are. Because the same God who keeps you when you've got a lot, the same God who keeps you when you have nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Paul learned that. Paul learned that regardless of what was going around him, he trusted God to somehow make a way for him. Anybody feel like that today? No matter what's mm -hmm. happening? Yeah. We have to approach life that way no matter what comes my way. Anybody got any fears and dreads and things you got to face and things you got to go through? No matter what comes my way, I've got to recognize that my God is in control. He said, I've learned how to be on top. I've learned how to be on the bottom. He said, I'm not thanking you because or, 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 or concerned about you giving to me. I want you to know that God is my sustainer. Amen. God has, uh, we think about our jobs as being our source, our uh, 401ks to be our future source. We think about all these things. But the bottom line is God wants us to understand that our bank situation and our income is not our source. God is our source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All these other things are resources. And resources can change, can't they? Yeah. We went from unemployment to employment, but God's going to keep them. Disability mm -hmm. to have ability, God's going to keep them. Right? Trials mm -hmm. and tribulations, but God's going to keep them. So resources can change. Jobs can close and jobs can open, but God is our sustainer. Amen? He is the one that keeps us. And Paul is letting, letting us know that he learned the secret. He learned the secret. He says this. This verse, I'm going to close out on. Paul learned the secret. Paul, how could you do all these things? Paul, how could you let the ups and downs of life not uh, change who you are? How can you rejoice in a prison situation? 
How can you rejoice when things are going contrary to you, when people are scheming against you? When you're arrested for doing the right thing. You're in God's pathway. You still experience trouble. How can you keep going, Paul? Paul says this in verse 13. I can. Y'all know this verse. Do all things. Mm -hmm. Through Christ. Through Christ. Through Christ. That's how we do it. My strength doesn't come from me. My strength doesn't come from people. My strength comes from inside. I can do all things through Christ. That doesn't mean I can run out and uh, run a marathon and say I'm doing it in Jesus' name. <laughs> <laughs> when we say all things, Paul said all the things that God allows me to go through, I can make it. All the area that God has given me influence over, I can do it. Mm. Every opportunity that God opens for me, I can do it because I'm doing it not in my strength, I'm doing it in his strength. Isn't it good to lean on somebody else's strength? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe you haven't ever come to the end of your strength and had nothing else to do but call on the Lord. But when you come to the end of your strength, that's when you meet God. Paul said, I glory in uh, the Corinthians. He said, I glory in my weaknesses. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? Paul said, I glory in my weaknesses. I glory in my lack. Most of us want to glory when things are going good. Thank God for this. Thank God for that. But Paul said, I glory in my weaknesses. I glory in my infirmities. You know why? He says, because when I'm weak, I'm strong. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What God is teaching us through our down times, he's teaching us independence from the world, but dependence on him. Mm -hmm. Trust in him. Yeah. Paul said, I, well, he says, when I'm weak, I'm strong. Because when I'm weak, he says, the power of Christ rests upon me. When I get to a place, I say, I can't do it. I can't make it. God says, good. That's where I want you. Because when I raise you up, it'll be no doubt that I was the one who did it. I know I got a witness somewhere. Here. Amen. When I bring you back into glory testimony, it wasn't a doctor. It wasn't a medication. It was me that brought you back. That's right. When Amen. I bring you back or when I bring you back from, I want it to be a testimony of what I can do. So God allows us to get low. Low. So to the point we have no more we have no more resources. And he reminds us, you don't need resources because I'm your source. Amen. 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 Abraham came back from fighting this big battle in the book of Genesis. This huge battle, getting Lot fighting, getting Sodom and Gomorrah's folk back and all belongings. He went back and fought, and he met this man um, by the name of Melchizedek. He gave Melchizedek ten part, and uh, then he had a fear because he had now exposed himself to the other nations by fighting. And God told Abraham, he said, Abram, his name was Abram at the time, he says, he says, I'm your reward, and I'm your protector. And that's all you need in it. Mm -hmm. God said, I'm the one. You don't have to fear what the nation is going to do, because I'm your, I'm your shield. Mm -hmm. I'm your sustainer. And David said this, and I'm going to finish with this, y'all. I said I'm going to finish a long time ago. <laughs> David said this, something we, we've heard all our lives. David said, the Lord is my, my shepherd. shepherd. Yes. I, I shall not want. Yes. What does that mean? It means when you have him, you have everything you need. That's right. mm -hmm. How many of you got everything you need? Amen. I have everything Amen. I need. Amen. I have everything I need. Because Jehovah, he provides. And he guides. And he keeps. David knew what a shepherd was. He knew what it was to shepherd sheep. And he realized what God really was. David was a shepherd. That's how he... Started out a little shepherd boy. He knew what it was to care over a flock, to love a flock more than you love yourself, to endanger yourself. He looked back on us like we realized, you know what? I was a shepherd, but you know what? The Lord is my shepherd. I had limitations, mm -hmm. but God had no limitations. When you know God is looking over your life, mm -hmm. you can say like Paul, I can't. Stop saying I can't. Stop saying I can't. <laughs> you can. Amen. Amen. I can. I can do what? All, all things. things. All that God has assigned me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God bless you. Amen. Amen.